I live in Ireland, uh, in Cork, uh, on the south coast of Ireland. And this is what we would refer to as a traditional uh, Irish breakfast. So some bacon, some sausages, black pudding, eggs, um, that kind of stuff. Not, not particularly healthy, uh, but uh, I tend to avoid this if at all possible, right? And you might wash that down with some orange juice. Uh, you might get some strong black coffee to kick your day off. Um, so let's say I wanted to go to a shop and buy that and, and cook that breakfast. What's that going to cost? So it's going to cost roughly 16 euros. I priced this up in Aldi a few weeks ago. So a packet of bacon, some sausages, some eggs, uh, orange juice, packet of coffee, and so on. I might get two breakfasts out of that. Okay. But let's say I was ambitious and I wanted to DIY this and do it myself. What's that going to cost? Well, it's significantly different. Um, first of all, I'm going to have to get into animal husbandry. Um, and I'm going to need all the associated equipment for that. Uh, if I want to make my own black puddings, then I'm going to need a scythe and some oat seeds, some fertilizer and a grinder. I've got to look after hens if I want eggs. Um, in Ireland, oranges don't grow so well. So I'm probably going to have to plop on a plane over to, over to Spain to pick my oranges. And if I want to get my nice Colombian roast, uh, well, return flights to Bogota are not cheap. So that comes in at about three and a half thousand euros to DIY my own breakfast. So orders of magnitude difference. Okay, that's all very nice. What's the point of that? Well, the point of that, of course, is that it is commoditization. And if you've been in the software industry for any length of time, you're probably familiar with commoditization, or at least I would, I would hope you're fairly familiar with commoditization. So if we look back over uh, the last maybe 15, 20 years of the software industry, uh, it's really been a story of increasing commoditization and going up levels of abstraction. So back in the, the kind of turn of the century, I guess, we cared about the entire stack. If we wanted to deliver services, we had to worry about hardware. So racking servers in data centers, racking servers uh, in, uh, even on premise. Uh, the operating system, we had to care about that. Runtime all the way up through the client tier. So we had, to, we had our expertise across the entire stack. As we move through the first decade, um, virtualization became a thing, so virtual servers, um, mainly a lot of it on-premise still and in data centers, but still uh, an increased level of abstraction. As we move through into the early 2010s uh, with the rise of uh, cloud, or the beginnings of cloud, um, we started to give away uh, control uh, to uh, for the, uh, the, the kind of hardware and OS levels uh, to cloud providers. So those skills became concentrated, um, which allowed us as application developers to move up a level of abstraction and uh, use, utilize the commodity services that were being provided. That's increased, of course, over the course of the last decade. Um, at the moment, a lot of people, are, a lot of folks are running containers and care about uh, things like Kubernetes. Uh, but again, that's becoming a managed service. And as we're seeing with the rise of um, we're able now just to deploy functions um, and come up two more levels of abstraction. So increased commoditization, increased abstraction, and that trend is only going to continue. So what about AI? Well, um, if you're into the far side, this is one of my favorite far side cartoons. Uh, so Paul Webster there blowing his uh, cerebral cortex uh, on some complicated math. If you want to, to really get into AI and machine learning, there's an awful lot to learn. Uh, if you want to get into neural network architectures and, and descent, uh, gradient descent algorithms and so on, there's a lot to wrap your head around. Um, so the question is, can we be effective with AI? AI? Uh, can we build business solutions in whatever uh, domain that we're operating in and take advantage of this technology without necessarily having to get in the weeds? Uh, in other words, do we need to DIY our own uh, AI and machine learning services? And I would suggest not, which is why we, uh, we've, we've written this book, uh, which is called AI as a Service. So that's myself and my co-author, Owen Shanahi, who happens to be the CTO of our company as well. Um, I guess the story here is really that AI and machine learning is commoditizing in the same way that other technologies uh, and the rest of the uh, delivery stack is commoditizing. Uh, it's the same story with AI and machine learning. And therefore, we can take advantage of those uh, of that commoditization in our own projects uh, to deliver results faster. So we stand on the shoulders of giants, as uh, I think Newton said. Uh, it's a forty percent discount code. I'll show that again later if anyone's uh, interested. And uh, Oliver has some uh, some free books to give away. 
um, to the first uh, three people that ask some questions. So there's an incentive for you. Uh, hopefully an incentive. Um, okay, so really the, the message is that it's just code and it, in the same way uh, it's just an API call away. So if you're able to um, do a small bit of um, math and make API calls, which is pretty much every developer, you can begin to leverage and use this technology. Um, if you look across the three major cloud providers, so AWS, uh, Google and Azure, uh, they all have a range of these offerings. Uh, which I'll, I'll explain in a bit more detail in a moment, um, and pick a language, uh, Python, Java, C Sharp, or JavaScript, or, 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 or even a language that you prefer. Uh, I'm going to do some examples in this talk, and I've, for the examples in this talk, I'm going to be using AWS and JavaScript. Uh, AWS really because it's the market leader in cloud, um, and so has the, the widest reach. Um, operates at the largest scale and is probably innovating faster than the other two at the moment, or that's debatable, and debate I'm not gonna get into. And JavaScript just happens to be my favorite language at the moment. So what are some of the forces that are driving um, the rise of AI as a service? So the usual suspects, I think, uh, the, we're still seeing increased growth of compute power. I think the um, rumors of Moore's Law's death are probably a little exaggerated right now. Um, of course, availability of data, uh, good quality uh, public data sets uh, becoming uh, more and more uh, available has helped drive uh, development of improved models. And of course, improved models, improved uh, software for machine learning and AI. On the, down, the downward pressures would be things like release cycles. We're all under, under pressure to release faster, release more often. Um, to decrease our iteration times and also the unit of deployment or the unit of scale uh, has been dropping from monoliths through to uh, containerized services and now to just deploying function as a service. If you couple those forces with the kind of economics of scale of cloud, it seems fairly inevitable that um, the rise of serverless is going to continue and the increased commoditization of AI is going to continue as well. So as developers, we really need to be able to uh, harness those services and, uh, and understand how to apply them in our own uh, particular domain and context. So some of the consequences, I think, is that really that serverless computing is gonna become the standard. Um, we will move much more towards fully uh, utility-based computing. Um, on top of that increased commoditization. And we will continue to see a growth in the range and uh, scope of uh, off-the-shelf AI machine learning components. And increasingly, uh, for enterprise development, we'll need to understand how to use these components, how to um, harness them and bolt them together to solve uh, business problems in whatever domain we're working in. So here's some data backing that. Uh, I've done this exercise a few times now. Uh, as I was writing the book, um, I went through and uh, computed the number of services that were available. And then after three months, uh, it looked like that was completely uh, <laughs> redundant. So I had to go off and do it again and again. This is probably out of date right now as well. Uh, so these are the counts of cloud services available across the, um, the major three providers. Uh, as of March 2020, so across compute, containers, database, storage network, um, and of course AI and machine learning. Um, I would note on this as well, of course, that some of the, uh, the, the differentiation between those service offerings is a little bit thin. Microsoft, of course, had to have the largest number of services. It's almost a, uh, a kind of competition for who has the most services, but there is real innovation and um, real utility that we can, we can use uh, in, our, in our work. So if we dig in on the AI and machine learning vector, what we find is that, again, across the three major providers, uh, there are very similar offerings uh, across a number of subject areas. So uh, for image processing, well, image and video processing, AWS have recognition, uh, Google have their video intelligence product, and Azure have face detector. Uh, again, recommender systems, speech to text and text to speech, chatbots, uh, predictive analytics, natural language processing, and also then support for training and customizing uh, your own models. So AutoML from Google, uh, SageMaker from Amazon, and so on. So, uh, and these range of services are growing uh, almost on a month by month basis. 
So when should you use, I don't know if there are any uh, data scientists um, listening in, um, really it's a spectrum. Uh, so if you're attacking a problem or you need to solve a business problem, which is co a commodity, which is kind of well understood, then really what, sh what we should be looking to do is to uh, operationalize or consume existing services. Uh, where the problem isn't so well understood, then of course, it's a question of needing to drop back to a lower level. So uh, actually going and building models ourselves um, and using tools like TensorFlow, notebooks and so on. But there is a, a spectrum in between whereby we can take commodity off the shelf AI services and actually adapt them to our own needs through transfer learning. And that is available again as, a, as an API call. And I'll have some examples of that in a moment as to how you can, um, how you can cross train some of these services to work in your own specific domain, which really means that rather than starting from ground zero, you can actually start uh, way up uh, with half or more of your problem solved. Um, and then just apply some knowledge uh, which is specific to your domain to adapt. Again, if you have just built a model, um, and so you've done the research and uh, you've, you've come up with a smart new model for in image recognition or in some specific domain, um, that's only really part of the solution. You've still got to host that model somewhere. You've still got to get data in and results out. Presumably you'll have, want to have some form of user interface uh, you'll need to scale that model. Of course, security is important. And again, uh, CICD, so in the same way that we need to have build pipelines for the code that we ship into production, we're gonna to want to be able to deploy updates to our model as we improve it over time. And of course, uh, monitoring, observability, and performance optimization. So just building the model is a small part of the overall delivery, but AI as a service can help us in operationalizing uh, what we've built uh, in the lab or what we've built from our research. So when we were writing the book, what we wanted to do was to put together uh, a kind of architectural context as to how these um, new kind of breed of AI services fit within our familiar uh, application stack. So this is a, a serverless rendering of that um, context on AWS. Uh, so at the top end here, we would have services like uh, WAF or API Gateway, CloudFront uh, for, for content distribution. Underpinning that, some synchronous services. So typically that's request response over HTTP and some asynchronous services. Uh, by that I mean uh, typically accessed over a message bus or some form of message queue. Of course, then we need some communication services for those, uh, those messages, um, service discovery and so on, and a bunch of other utilities to help secure. Um, so uh, KMS or Cognito in this context. Under that then are our uh, AI services and of course underpinned by our, our data layer. So uh, service databases like Dynamo, Aurora or S3 storage. Um, over this side, of course, we're going to need some form of development support. So we need to have some way of doing infrastructure as code using things like CloudFormation, um, Terraform or similar tools, uh, and code pipeline. And then, of course, we're going to need to monitor our models. And again, uh, AI as a service and service technology can help with that whole uh, observability piece. So given that we've, we've got this context, um, as we were writing the book, we set ourselves a challenge, um, and that was... Uh, can we build a cat detector system in a day? Um, because after all, cat detectors are the hello world of AI. Uh, if you go to enough, um, enough AI talks, you'll probably hear a lot of people talking about uh, detecting cats in images. So the hello world. So this is Eric, Eric the happy cat, and he's a really cool cat. So I got an extra book code to give away actually to the first person that can tell me the name of John Cleese's character in that sketch. Um, we'll see how you guys do with that. Maybe I'm just showing my age there, right? <laughs> so it turns out that uh, if, you, if you apply yourself to this, you can build a cat detector, a fully operational cat detector system in, in around about a day. It's a fairly long day, but it can be done. Um, and so this is, our, uh, this is our cat detector system. Um, so here's the UI over on this left-hand side here. Um, so you can see that what we've done is we fed in some cat images and we've got some responses back. And that's allowed us to build a word cloud and also plot a histogram of um, label, uh, label density here. So the system is, is fairly straightforward, layered on top of the uh, architecture we, we just discussed. Um, one pop an a, a, a URL for uh, inspection into, into um, a browser, 
that gets, goes through a gateway into a synchronous service that pops it onto WorkCube. That feeds into a crawler service, which goes off and scrapes the images from the site. And for each image that's scraped, it pops another message onto um, a work queue, and that feeds into uh, an analysis service, which kicks off the image recognition. We get results back from that, store all the results in S3, and then those are available for, uh, for inspection through the front end. So I can, uh, if I jump over here, uh, I can show you the system running. So uh, of course, here's one I did earlier uh, for cats. And if I just click on that, you'll see uh, that we have our word cloud and here are our cats. So the theme that you'll, you'll need to become familiar with if you're adopting these AI services is that of uh, confidence level. Um, so here, what, what we have is this picture that's been analyzed and we've got uh, animal and the confidence level is 92%, this is an animal. Uh, mammal 90% and cat 88% um, and so on through all of these. So it's important when you're interpreting results back from these services, that you understand the, uh, the, the confidence level and what confidence levels you're prepared to tolerate within the, the particular domain that you're trying to solve a problem for. So we might try uh, another search here. So I, I'm not personally um, an image recognition expert, but I have friends who have, and they tell me that giraffes uh, can often fool these systems. Uh, or these algorithms. So what I'm going to do is uh, I just need to move the video screen there. There we go. Um, pop the URL in there and ask it to analyze. And I'll just refresh the page there. Okay, so it's downloaded images from that search. And we click again. Okay, those have been analyzed. And we'll hit that. And there we go. So not too bad. Uh, it's you know, identified a lot of giraffes, but it has been fooled a little bit by uh, one or two leopards in there. Um, and again, it's a, it's a case of looking at the confidence level on the images and figuring out uh, what you're prepared to tolerate. So the reason, obviously the reason why giraffes um, are spotted in this is because all of the people that build these services for us are well aware that giraffes can fool these systems and so have probably taken additional care to make sure that giraffes pass the test. And um, another interesting search to do might be for Terminator, let's say. Um, and if we pop that in, we'll see how that goes. I'll just refresh again. Okay, we downloaded. And okay, those have been analyzed. And again, we've got our word cloud and our keyword density. When I first did this search a while ago, um, I was kind of, I, I, was, I found it qu quite amusing because um, this is apparently clothing, apparel, or a helmet. Uh, but it hasn't come up with a label killer robot. Um, I don't think there's anything nefarious about that, to be honest. Um, the reason why, of course, is that uh, the uh, killer robots are a fairly kind of constrained domain, and so it wouldn't, these particular service wouldn't have been trained to recognize killer robots. I don't think there's anything more than that. However, we can, of course, we could, of course, take this, uh, this service and cross train it. Um, to recognize killer robots. And I'll, I'll give an example of how that can be done in a moment. Okay, so what else can you do with these uh, image recognition services? So first of all, um, if you look at that cat detector system, um, only a very small part of that was actually concerned with doing the image analysis. Uh, and to show you that, I've got a notebook here and I have popped some images up into an S3 bucket. So there's a few of them there. So first of all, let's look at a picture of a cat, um, start from ground zero. If I want to actually do image recognition on a cat, it's, it's as simple as these uh, lines of code here. So I construct some JSON that says, uh, here's a bucket I want you to look at, and here's the, uh, the reference to an image in the bucket. Um, I only want you to return 10 labels. So don't do any more than 10 labels, and only return things where your confidence level is greater than 80%, okay? Once I set that up, uh, it's a simple matter of calling a single API and I get a bunch of results back. So we can run that now, uh, which I'll do. And there are our labels coming back. So animal uh, with a confidence level of 92, pet, mammal, um, cat, and so on. So again, it's up to you to figure out how you're going to treat the results, uh, what level of error you're, you're prepared to tolerate uh, in your particular domain. Okay, so another thing which has been in the news I see recently is uh, face detection. So here's some people at an office um, having a chat around a laptop. Uh, I remember offices 
Uh, I haven't been in an office for a while. Um, I'm kind of missing offices. I never thought I'd say that, but there you go. Um, so can we do facial detection? Absolutely. Um, and again, it's just a single API call. So uh, we just call rec tech faces. Um, and then I've got a small bit of code to draw some boxes. So if we just kick that off right now, and get quickly, we will have uh, a data set back. So this is our result set, which has X, Y coordinates for the uh, faces that have been detected. And then if we just overlay that over, uh, you can see that it's picked up all of those. So again, you don't need to be um, an expert in uh, image recognition to be able to apply this technology. Uh, the ethics of whether that's a good or a bad thing, I'll, uh, I'll punt on uh, for this talk. So here's another one that's surprising. This is me uh, hanging out with some of my celebrity buddies uh, a while ago, obviously. I actually don't have any celebrity buddies, of course, but this was pre-lockdown, right? Um, so celebrity detection is actually built into some of these services, okay? So again, there's a single API, uh, recognize celebrities. So if we kick it off and see how it does, uh, and give it a moment, we'll see that uh, not only has it uh, given us coordinates for the faces, but it's also recognized Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, Marion Collatard, and Tilda Swinton. Unfortunately, it didn't recognize this uh, handsome bold chap over here, so I'll have to uh, try a bit harder in future, uh, obviously. Uh, when I first saw that, I was a little bit surprised. I was like, why would you do that? But of course, news organizations uh, and so on uh, could certainly have a, a real need for that type of, um, that type of technology. Um, so uh, for a final example on uh, image detection, uh, let's look at uh, face searching. So uh, here we have uh, John Luke Picard, uh, otherwise known as Patrick Stewart. Um, and we're going to see, Given this image, can we find Patrick Stewart uh, in this image of him and all his celeb buddies hanging out at the Oscars? Incidentally, by the way, I think that, uh, I, I think he's right. I think Kirk did make a better captain. Um, not that he was a better actor. Uh, I think it was more really the, the kind of crass acting um, made it, uh, or the overacting in the original series made it entertaining to watch, but uh, I'm digressing. So this is, think of this almost as like red, um, searching for a string within a string, except we're doing it with images. Um, because we can do that with a single API call, uh, which is compare faces. So if I run that now, um, you'll see in a moment uh, that given that uh, source image, uh, we, it was able to detect uh, Patrick Stewart here uh, in the, uh, amongst all of these other faces, which again, I'm not going to comment on the ethics, uh, but it does show the power of these services um, that are just an API call away. Uh, just a note on customization then, um, if I did want, say, to create a, an image recognition system that was capable of, uh, of recognizing killer robots, uh, I could certainly do that uh, by creating a fresh project. Um, my problem is really uh, just to assemble a training set, a labeled training set of data. But once I've done that, um, with a single API call, I can feed that data set in. Uh, I can then get a handle back to a, a, a a trained model which has been cross-trained into my particular domain, which in this case is killer robots. Um, and then just, just with another API call, I'm, I can go and uh, detect killer robots should I desire to do that. So whilst you can achieve the same results by building your own models using TensorFlow and so on, the, the speed with which you can, uh, you can apply this technology is obviously uh, miles ahead of what you would do if you were going to cook it yourself. Um, obviously, just bear in mind the costs. Um, it's only a, a cent per standard image uh, recognition, but for custom models, uh, the cost does go up a bit. So that's something to bear in mind uh, if, you're, if you're experimenting with this technology. Okay, so um, that's all well and good. Uh, that's a greenfield system. Um, we were building that from scratch, so we can apply all the latest uh, WYSI technology and so on, and we don't have to be constrained by uh, any legacy but of course we all know that the real world is a bit messy and sometimes looks a bit like this and i'm sure most people on this call would have had to at some time uh, or even now deal with kind of sprawling messy uh, technology estates like this i know i certainly have so can we apply all of this uh, this new tech uh, onto a legacy estate like this where we've got some business process that we could automate uh, and improve with ai and machine learning um, well, here's some patterns that we've had some success with in the past. So one is obviously um, a simple bridge uh, to an API with request and response. Most organizations these days, of course, do run hybrid uh, cloud estates or even multi-hybrid cloud estates. 
Um, and so putting your, uh, putting your uh, image recognition pieces or, or whatever AI pieces you want uh, behind an API and using a simple request response button can be very effective. Um, for longer running inference jobs, um, again, using a simple API with a poll-based uh, mechanism to get your results can work fairly well, depending on the context. But if you have much larger volumes of data, then we've had a fair bit of success in using something like Kafka um, uh, to stream uh, data in and, and results back out, um, typically using maybe a managed Kafka on the, uh, on the cloud side um, and uh, a, a small uh, Kafka cluster uh, running on the, uh, within, the, within the estate. Okay, so for a second example from the book, um, we wanted to look at something a little bit chunkier uh, rather than cat detection. So we took the example of social CRM. So a few years ago, building a social CRM would have been a fairly large undertaking, and it still is a fairly large undertaking. But some of the smart pieces that are, that are in those systems um, can now be automated uh, using commodity components rather than having to do the research yourself. So if we take the example of an organization which is selling um, across multiple territories um, with multiple departments, um, how, do, how, do we, how do we automate the process of taking customer feedback and uh, triaging it and routing complaints to the appropriate department? So if you imagine there's a whole bunch of information coming in over Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, email, web forms, uh, whatever, can we push that into a funnel, um, separate out the, uh, the complaints and figure out where those complaints should be routed to? So we need to first of all detect the language, uh, do some translation, figure out the sentiment, figure out the appropriate department and then route that message on. So uh, here's our take on how you would build that using uh, AI as a service. So at the front end, uh, a gateway to take all the, the data in. Uh, streamed into a Lambda function which hooks into our language detection and translation APIs. These again are just commodity uh, off-the-shelf components. Um, once you have a response from that, kick forward into another stream um, to do sentiment detection. Again, a commodity component. We can then throw away the positives because we're only concerned with the negatives um, and then feed those forward into a classifier. And I'll show this in a moment, but in this case, uh, we, we cross-trained the classifier to be uh, to fit our, our specific domain. So if I drop back over to the notebook here, oh, excuse me. Okay, there we go. Um, so here's the here's the process again. So if we look at the code to actually execute these APIs, um, first of all, language detection. Um, Again, it's a single API call to detect the dominant language. So within a body of text, you may have mixed language. Uh, one of those will be the dominant language, in which case uh, that's what will get returned uh, through this. Um, once we've detected the language, then translation, again, uh, can be as simple as calling a, a single API, for, certainly for short documents. Uh, obviously, for longer translation jobs, then you're looking at batch-type processing. Uh, sentiment analysis. Again, is a single API call for, uh, for a, a small block of text. Um, and we get some uh, responses back that are positive, negative, or mixed. And I'll talk a little bit in a minute about um, how, you need to in or how you can interpret the responses back from uh, the these various APIs. Uh, for the custom classifier, which is this step here, um, what we did was to say, let's take um, an open source data set um, so we took the Amazon um, product graph review data set, which is available from uh, Stanford, and across uh, four, ca four categories, um, so automotive, beauty, office, and pet. Uh, that pulled down about half a million records, uh, keep five for testing and uh, the other uh, for training. Uh, and then it's a simple uh, case of building a CSV file, so label and then the actual text. That can be pushed up into an S3 bucket and then a training job kicked off and kicking that training job off is, uh, again, a single API call. That can take uh, one to two hours, depending on the, the volume, well, take even longer, depending on the volumes of data. Uh, but once that training job is complete, then you have a handle uh, on your, your custom classifier that you can just call um, in order to, to run. And what you have now is, again, instead of starting at ground zero and building uh, a classifier from scratch, you've started way up here, and all you've done is, is leverage uh, some technology in the cloud to, to, to transfer learn across into the specific domain that you're interested in dealing with. 
Okay, so we're going to kick some messages through this uh, pipeline now. Um, so when I run this, it's going to throw some messages into the gateway from our, our testing set. And those are going to make the way all the way through. Um, and we'll hopefully we'll have some results out in the data bucket. So let me just do that. Uh, and we'll kick that off here. So again, this code is just posting to um, a RESTful API. Okay, there's a few gone through there. So we've got a mixture of positive and negative um, and various sizes of text. Maybe kick a, a few th more through there. Okay. And uh, if we look down here, we should have probably all processed by now. Let's have a quick look in the bucket. Okay, there's a few in there. So we've got auto beauty and then we've got some unclassified in there. So let's, uh, let's look at the results that have come out and see if they make sense. Okay, so now we've got, uh, okay, 24 inch wiper blade. That sounds like automotive and it's negative. Okay, um, that looks fairly automotive to me as well. Uh, okay, there we go. And under beauty, yeah, that's a tanning product. And that looks like a hair product. Um, and again, okay, a HB office jet. And okay, dry, dry razor, right? Okay, and then we have an unclassified one. So, uh, what you might have noticed as well, of course, is these are all negative sentiments. Uh, this one here is actually mixed rather than negative. Um, these are all negative as well. So, when you're when we run our th this particular AI service, uh, what we get back is a sentiment score. So, we get a, a grading for positive. Uh, negative, uh, neutral, and mixed. Um, so it's up to us to interpret those results based on our tolerance for getting things wrong um, and whether we need to call a human into the loop. Um, so the way we've coded it in this instance is to say, um, if the results are neutral, mixed, or mixed, treat them as negative. That means we're erring on the side of caution. Uh, we could have said we're only going to take strongly negative. For positive uh, results, we check the sentiment score. And in this case, we said if it's less than 85%, we're going to treat it as negative anyway. So that would be an, an example of erring on the side of caution and saying we, we definitely want to make sure that um, we pick up any, any negatives. Again, in a different um, scenario, your mileage might vary and you, you might want different rules in, as to how you interpret the responses coming out of this. Uh, again, in, in here we've said if the confidence level in the result is less than 95%, we treat it as unclassified. So each of these ones that have been boxed into office or beauty, we have a greater than 95% confidence level that that's correct. Uh, this unclassified one does not have a 95%, and so it's been putting to unclassified. So presumably in a live system, what you'd be able to do then is to say, uh, the unclassifieds need to need a human in the loop to actually uh, to pick up the pieces that the uh, AI was not able to cope with. So just a quick look then at what else we can do with this service, which is called Comprehend. Um, entity detection is another interesting use case. So here's an article about uh, a recent article on Virgin Galactic. Um, again, we're going to do a single API call, uh, which is to detect entities in this text. Um, if I run that, uh, you'll see that from that, that corpus of text, uh, we've been able to pick out Virgin Galactic, um, some people, uh, Richard Branson obviously is in there, uh, some quantities, uh, some dates and locations as well. Okay, and again, a single API call takes a very short amount of time to run. Uh, here's an article about the Mars rover, and we're just going to look quickly at this to get out key phrases. So in this case, it's pulled out a number of key phrases like Quake signals, um, US Space Agency lead probe, um, again, with, with various uh, fairly high, in this case, confidence levels. Um, so again, beware of the costs. Um, the, the headline cost looks pretty low. Uh, you're looking at uh, costs of a cent um, per entity detection, um, or less than a cent, actually, I think, for entity detection. Uh, but once you start doing training and running your own custom jobs, the costs can rise. Uh, so just be, be conscious of that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, finish up now with a few real-world examples. Um, so the first one is uh, KYC. So this is a great example of how commoditization uh, can catch up with you. 
So back in 2017, we were working for a client and uh, the job was to, can you take a, a scan of a utility bill and detect, automatically detect the name, address and other pieces from the form. So back then, way back in 2017, uh, we had to use an OCR library, uh, an open source one, to get the block line and word structure. And once we've got that block line and word structure, a bit of math to compute the boxes uh, and then feed forward the, the text in those boxes into our own custom classifier to pick out names and addresses, which was a fair bit of work, um, maybe five, six weeks work to get it working properly. Today, would we do that? Absolutely not. Uh, today, that's available as a commodity um, from each of the three providers. So AWS have Textract, Azure have their form recognizer product, and Google have Cloud Vision OCR. So as an example of that, if we come over to this notebook here, I've uh, got some images again up in a bucket. This is a past, not a real part. Um, so I can use Textract here, uh, and just with an API call, ask it to analyze the document, and I'm telling it, can you please look for form fields in this document? So if I run that, uh, we should get some responses back. There we go, and it's picked out passport number, surname, given names, nationality, date of birth, and so on with varying degrees of confidence. So I would say the surname here at 75% is probably a little bit low. Um, you definitely want it a bit higher than that, but the rest of the fields have come through at fairly high confidence intervals. So again, that's commoditization, um, speeding time to development and, and reducing the need to go and build all of this stuff yourself. Okay, here's another example, uh, room rate optimization. So uh, the problem being, if uh, you price your hotel room too high, uh, no one's going to buy it, and if you price it too low, you're not optimizing your profit. So we worked with a company who uh, provide hotel uh, price optimization as a service, and initially they were doing that using a team of human beings uh, with tacit knowledge. But if you feed in historical room rates and occupancy, live rates, uh, competition data, local events, weather, and all that kind of stuff into an off-the-shelf service, in this case, uh, AWS Forecast, uh, and do some transfer uh, learning, you can start to come up with uh, room rate recommendations. Uh, so again, automating those business processes with AI as a service. And uh, final example is in Agritech. Uh, so we're working with a company who provide a service to farmers, which is obviously a big thing here in Ireland, um, to optimize fertilizer usage. So there's two forces here. One is the fact that there are very strong EU regulations uh, on the use of uh, nitrate fertilizers. And the other is, of course, that you want to optimize your spreading time so you get the best grass growth. Grass growth. So what these guys do is they place a camera uh, with some other IoT sensors um, at the head of a paddock, and that takes things like rainfall data, uh, nitrate levels in the soil, and so on. Um, and then it also takes images of the grass at regular intervals. Uh, those are fed up into a, a deep learning model, which has been trained specifically to, um, to recognize grass quality from images. Um, and in this case, uh, the guys that actually built their model um, using TensorFlow in the lab, they'd optimized that. The problem here was how do you rapidly uh, operationalize that to go from you know, uh, bits of IoT kit and a, uh, a deep learning model to something that can actually be operationalized. And again, by using AI as a service type technologies and serverless, uh, the, the path to actually operationalizing that was, uh, was super rapid. Okay, so um, just, in, just in summary then, um, service computing I think is gonna become the standard for enterprise development. And increasingly as developers, we're gonna need to deal with AI because they're going to be increasing demand for, uh, for businesses to incorporate this type of technology within their processes and for us as developers to be able to understand that and apply this. Um, so you can do that without a deep knowledge and without a PhD of machine learning, but you do need to be able to understand how to interpret and handle the results. Uh, it's not just about the model, uh, it's about operation, operationalizing it as well. Uh, so there's the book code and uh, thank you very much indeed. I hope that was informative and useful.